Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in a previous video in this series, we looked at the self-biased configuration of a common cathode amplifier. In this lecture, we're going to do a small signal analysis of the same amplifier. Although, of course, the math here will apply to any sort of similar amplifier stage. So the general structure of a common cathode amplifier can take many forms. This is one of the most common forms. So here we have our input voltage. Here we have a grid leak resistor. This forms the input impedance of our circuit because under normal operating conditions, no current is floating through the grid. So it's not really interesting for the rest of the analysis we're going to do. So I'm going to leave it out in the schematics for the rest of the slides here. So here I've drawn two resistors connected to the cathode. For computing the bias circuit, this is considered open. We can decompose this circuit into the DC bias circuit, shown here that we looked at last time, and the small signal circuit that we'll focus on in this lecture. Remember that we're using all capital letters to represent the DC bias quantities, all lowercase letters to represent the small signal circuit quantities, and variables that have a lowercase main variable symbol and uppercase subscripts to indicate the complete signal. So we're going to assume that for the signal frequencies of interest that this capacitor can be approximated as a short. So we can replace what we have down here with a parallel combination that I'll indicate with this superscript AC. Very often this RKC is zero. So RKAC in that instance is in fact zero. We'll talk about that more later. So we will continue our analysis of the first stage of the Mesa Boogie dual rectifier, focusing on this part of the circuit here. So if you haven't seen the previous lecture talking about biasing, I recommend you go check that out. But if you haven't, you can keep watching this one and get the gist of what's going on. As a bit of review, we drew a load line that you see here in red and a grid line that you see here in green and found the intersection to find the quiescent operating point. So we discovered that the quiescent plate current was 0.9 milliamps and the quiescent plate to cathode voltage was approximately 200 volts. There's markings on the Mesa Boogie schematic that suggest this number is a little bit lower, but this is close enough for rock and roll. And we also did some calculations to show that the quiescent grid to cathode voltage was minus 1.62 volts. Really, minus 1.6 is close enough. That's what it says on the schematic. And the reason we need this particular number, the 0.9 milliamps, is that we need to look up what the various small signal parameters are for that particular bias current. So this can get a little bit tricky. If you look at the various divisions down here, five divisions corresponds to 0.1 milliamp. And this is different on every data sheet. So you just have to figure it out for your particular data sheet. So 0.9 winds up here and we intersect three different curves. As I mentioned in a previous lecture, this can be very confusing because we're plotting three different quantities that have three different units. So you have to look over to the side to see what the units are. Here we are interested in the amplification factor mu which is 100 and very conveniently is 100 over a wide range of current values, which is why we like to use the particular forms we do that involve mu, instead of GM, which is what you would typically focus on when dealing with transistors. We're also going to need the dynamic plate resistance RP. And if we look that up, this is a bit tricky. Essentially, each division here is 20 kilo ohms. So if we were to take this line here, this vertical green line, and intersect it with the RP curve, we get 72 kilo ohms. We're not really going to need it for this lecture, but just as a sanity check, let's also check out the transconductance. So the transconductance, if I intersect the vertical green line here with the GM curve, I get 1400 micromoles. So just as a sanity check, I should be able to take RP and multiply it by GM and get mu. When I plug in those values, I get 100.8 and I declare victory. Now, there's something sneaky hiding in the background that sometimes you do need to worry about. 
This graph is for a plate to cathode voltage of 250 volts, but our actual plate to cathode bias voltage is 200 volts. So different data sheets will handle this differently. This one doesn't really give you any other information. If you had to try to guess what was going on for some sort of extreme plate to cathode voltage, you might have to try to estimate values from the graph. Usually if you have something this close, you're better off just grabbing values from a graph like this and running with them. If it's a graph that has curves for multiple plate to cathode voltages, find the one that is closest to yours and just use it. You're usually better off doing that than trying to estimate it from other curves on the data sheet, but your mileage may vary. It's situation dependent. So I'm going to drive some formulas using generic variable symbols, and then we'll go back and plug these particular values in later. I've also found that writing the superscript AC all the time is a bit annoying. So in the remaining slides, I'm going to drop that superscript. Just know that our new RK corresponds to this parallel combination. Okay, so let's do a deep dive into this small signal model for the common cathode amplifier. Well, this little AC that represents our small signal model for the triode. So I can go ahead and put that in. So we have our RK down here, we have our voltage input, and we have this load resistance. Again, this is representing part of the amplifier circuit and not representing some load later downstream in the circuit that we're feeding. So the triode is replaced with this voltage controlled voltage source and this dynamic plate resistance. Again, this is part of our mathematical model. It pops out of the linearization. It's not representing something like the resistance of the lead going to the plate. It's its own thing, and it changes with the bias current. Mu, on the other hand, stays stable over a wide range of bias currents, which makes it particularly nice to deal with. Now, if you know some basic circuit analysis, you can use the various tricks you know to find V out from Vn. It's not hard but there's a particularly nice way to approach it if we use the Thevenin equivalents that we derived in the last lecture. So let's review what those are. I wanted to write them in a fairly generic way. I'm saying Thevenin equivalent looking down into the negative terminal of the voltage controlled voltage source. I'm avoiding saying Thevenin equivalent looking into the plate because I've deliberately left out RP here and that is part of the tube. You could say something metaphysical, like say, we're looking into the inner plate or something like that. I like to present it this way and then add in RP later if I need it. So generically, we could have some sort of voltage source sitting out here at the grid. We could have some other voltage source feeding the direction of the cathode. This whole thing could represent some sort of super complicated network that we've reduced to its own Thevenin equivalent. In our case, this R-bot, well, that's just going to be our RK. Nothing fancy there. In any case, the Thevenin equivalent we computed basically said, okay, well, we'll have our two voltage sources. Our VKK will come through without an inversion. VGG comes through with an inversion. VGG comes through multiplied by mu, whereas VKK comes through multiplied by mu plus one. So pretty close, but the VKK is just that much more. Anyway, the main interesting thing is that this R-bot, which in the example we're about to do here will be RK, is multiplied by mu plus one. So in this particular case, we only have voltage coming in through the grid. VKK is zero, so we don't really have this term. So our Thevenin equivalent reduces to something like this. Okay, so now let's take this Thevenin equivalent and substitute it into our small signal model for the common cathode amplifier. So here's our original small signal circuit. Here's what it looks like when we substitute in the model for the triode. And we want to place all of this stuff looking down into the negative terminal of the VCVS with our Thevenin equivalent. So here, Vn is playing the role of VGG and RK is playing the role of R-bot. Now, once we've written this schematic, we have something that's both easy to analyze and gives us a natural interpretation. If we want to know what V out is, 
Well, we start with the result from this voltage-controlled voltage source, which is just minus mu Vn, but we don't get all of it. We see it through a voltage divider. It's written in a way that's a little strange. If you want, you can imagine sort of taking this and flipping it sideways and then rewriting this RL to ground so the ground's actually going downward. Basically, if you turn your laptop sideways and then imagine turning RL sideways again, you'll see it. Anyway, we see it through this voltage divider. So we're dividing over RL. So we have RL in the numerator and we have the series resistance of the set. So I have RL plus RP plus this mu plus one RK. So if I want to write down a formula for the gain, let's call it A, well, that's just V out over VN, and here you go. And I like this way of thinking about it. The triode itself has an inherent voltage gain of mu, but we wind up losing some of it through the circuitry, part of which is stuff that we picked that we had to put in here in order to actually bias the circuit and make it work, and part of which is inherent to the operation of the tube itself. Also notice that if you had a magical tube with massive amounts of voltage gain, so if mu is really, really, really massive, if you were to say let mu go to infinity, this term here, the mu plus one times rk, would eventually swamp this RL plus RP, and you would wind up with something in the limit that was like RL divided by RK. And that kind of formula would look familiar to people who deal with transistors because you usually have some resistor down here that's providing either emitter degeneration or source degeneration, depending on whether you're using a BJT or a FET and RL would then correspond to your collector resistor or your drain resistor. But you really can't use that formula for tubes very often. What you'll find is if you compute A using this full formula, and then you try to compute it using this approximation of just RL over RK, it winds up being too far off. Mu is just not big enough in general for that kind of approximation to work. You really need to compute the whole thing. The other thing I want to mention is that in transistor circuits, unless you have some other negative feedback somewhere else in the path, you'll always use some sort of resistance down here to lower the gain, but then also to make it less susceptible to changes in the gain of the transistor itself. Because the gain properties of transistors vary a lot from transistor to transistor and with temperature, tubes, on the other hand, are fairly predictable. Once your tubes are warmed up, if the data sheet tells you mu's 100, you can really count on mu being 100. And you can count on that if you swap in different tubes of the same make as well. Whereas if you swap in different transistors, you could get all sorts of different things. That's one fundamental difference between designing with tubes and designing with transistors. So because mu is dependable, and it will give us an A that's reasonably predictable, Quite often, people will just leave out RK. So they'll zero this out, and they'll zero this out, and then they'll zero this out. And we wind up with a very simple formula. We have the inherent amplification factor of the tube times this voltage divider. Beautiful formula. And I'll leave it as an exercise for the interested viewer to start with this circuit here and compute V out with respect to Vn using Kirchhoff's voltage law without using this fancy Thevenin equivalent. And you'll see the beauty of the Thevenin equivalent approach. Okay, so we computed the gain. We know that the input impedance is set by the grid leak resistance. What about the output resistance? Well, for that, we need to zero out this voltage source. And then we have a fairly easy calculation. So we have two resistances in parallel. One is going to the quote-unquote real ground. The other is going to our small signal ground. But our circuit theory doesn't care that they're different kinds of grounds. So the resistance seen looking into the output is just our load resistance in parallel with RP in series with RK times mu plus 1. Now, if we leave out this RK, so we don't have any cathode degeneration. Well, that simplifies things a lot. We can get rid of this term. And then the output impedance is just RL in parallel with little RP.
Okay, so what do these formulas look like when we actually plug in the various values for the Mesa Boogie dual rectifier? Well, RL is 220K, and in the case of the situation on the left where this light-dependent resistor operating as a switch is closed, well, in that case, we wind up bypassing all of these resistors, RK equals zero, so that's our completely bypassed case, RK equals zero. In the case where this LDR switch is left open, I have these two resistance in parallel, which is around 1.7K. So as you might expect, if you completely bypass the cathode resistance, you get the highest gain. But if you have some cathode resistance in there, then you wind up lowering the gain. Let's see, we have RL, we have our RKs. We need to know our mu, which is 100. And we need to know RP, which is 72K. All right. So if we plug those values into our gain formulas for the fully bypass case, we get a gain of 100 from the triode itself, but we lose some of that. So going through the divider, we lose about 25% of that gain, and we're left with a gain of 75.34. This is inverting gain, so I have a minus sign in front of everything here. But in general discussions, people will often just say, we have a gain of, and give the absolute value of this number. And you just know, well, it's a common cathode stage, so you know it's inverting. All right, so if we include that 1.7K resistance in there, we wind up with 101 that's this 100 plus 1. You could probably reasonably approximate that as 100 if you wanted, but we have calculators now, so you might as well put in 101. Anyway, we have 101 times 1 1.7. Uh, let's see, I should put K ohm here. I guess I ran out of space. All right, so if we take a look at what that looks like, ah, I need a K ohm in here. All right, so the reason I wanted to write it like this is to see the relative effect of the different terms. The original RL plus RP gave us 292, and this new mu plus 1 RK term gives us 171.7. So that gives you a sense of the contribution of the different factors to the denominator, giving us a lower gain of 47.44, and again, it is an inverting gain. Okay, so what about the output impedances? Well, for the fully bypass case, RL in parallel with RP is 220 kilo ohms in parallel with 72 kilo ohms, giving us 54.2 kilo ohms. All right, so what about that lower gain setting? We now have this 171.7 being added to the 72. So we now have something like 220 in parallel with 243.7 instead of 220 in parallel with 72. So as you might expect, this gives us a worse output impedance. And actually, neither of these output impedances are great. So it's very common to follow something like this with a cathode follower that has much better output impedance if, say, you're driving a passive tone stack, which we'll look at later in the semester. Or you might just make sure that you're feeding something that has a very high input impedance, like another common cathode stage, where it doesn't matter that this output impedance is so mediocre. Before we close out, I should give one caveat to our analysis. Namely, I've assumed that the resistance of the LDR is zero in this closed state. It's not. It's a small number, but it's not zero. Similarly, I've assumed that the resistance of the LDR in this open state is infinite. It's not. It's a really big number, but it's not infinite. But our rough analysis is probably close enough to get in the ballpark.